Thank you. I must uh, thank the organizers for the opportunity to talk today. Uh, the, the title of the talk that I was given was Viscosity slash Rheology, which is quite broad. So I've taken the liberty to kind of weave a, a little bit of a story throughout that topic. Uh, I did come from Queensland, Australia, and apologies, I'm quite jet lagged still. I only arrived in the last 24 hours. And so I think it's kind of midnight or in the middle of the morning right now for me. <laughs> Effectively, I come from this country where we've got these oh, funny, funny animals with the pouch and they're marsupials. And basically the red cell, we basically started looking at some comparative biology and just to show that I've come so far away, these are erythrocytes from a kangaroo and they actually share some very fundamental properties that us placenteal mammals also have. Uh, just to point out, they've got a beautifully large surface area relative to the volume. You can imagine if you got a little pump and blew this cell up, it would become quite spherical. Now the fact that it has such a surface area means that it is very flexible or deformable and can pass through the microcirculation very effectively. Some other biophysical properties dictate blood flow both at the large macro vessel level as well as down at the microcirculation. And thus I will talk about some of this in a little while. So I guess the question might be, why do we care about blood viscosity? You know, it's often the poor cousin when we think of the hagen poiset equation. I, I'd like to include Hagen because I'm here in Germany. But effectively, we know that basically the vessel radius is incredibly important for dictating flow. Now, that's assuming that we've got a normal reactive vessel. Once we start to see endothelial dysfunction, the properties of the fluid itself that are passing through the tube become increasingly important. And you think most of our pathologies do have some form of endothelial dysfunction or rigidifying of the tube itself. Some conditions that basically alter blood viscosity include inflammatory conditions, we're very familiar with those, as well as hematological disorders. These things, the classic example might be sickle cell disease where we have extremely rigid and sickle-like erythrocytes. Now, I guess one thing that we're really starting to understand is that the circulatory support, which is used to uh, support, uh, I guess, cardiothoracic interventions, both implantables as well as um, extracorporeal, these things do alter blood viscosity in a fairly predictable way. And uh, we've been exploring that in some detail. So hopefully we've made a very quick case for why we study blood viscosity. I guess I'd like to highlight that blood viscosity isn't a constant. I know when I read most medical textbooks, they kind of throw in a 3.5 to 3.8 millipascal second value for blood viscosity. And then we really focus on vessel radius. I guess the question that I'd like to pose here is that blood viscosity is far from constant. In, in fact, it's actually the classic shear thinning fluid that we can observe. Uh, you can see here on the y-axis, viscosity of the fluid being blood in this case. On the uh, x-axis, we have the shear rate, which is, I guess you can assume, is quite similar to the flow rate in a cylindrical tube. And what we can see on all four of those curves is that there is a shear thinning effect. Basically, blood becomes thinner less viscous as we increase the flow rate. Now, we do know that hematocrit is one of the primary determinants of blood viscosity. We can see four curves here, basically from 20% hematocrit, the lowest uh, of these curves, up to 50% hematocrit. And so we can see that as we have more cells in the fluid, it makes sense also that the, um, this uh, cellular phase is dictating blood viscosity. But we also need to uh, be aware that hematocrit does not always predict blood viscosity. So if we look pre and post intervention at just hematocrit, it's actually a very poor proxy for the fluid properties. In fact, other factors, we know uh, temperature like all fluids a solution, the plasma itself making up 50, 60% of the total volume, uh, its viscosity and therefore composition does dictate blood viscosity as well. Uh, dehydration, probably a few of us feeling dehydrated today, are probably quite aware that our viscosity is sensitive to the plasma viscosity itself. We've already mentioned shear rate, but incre increasingly important are the properties of the cells themselves. And we're talking about the very minute physical properties of the erythrocytes that um, we can explore and explain why blood is a shear thinning fluid. So one of the classic properties of erythrocytes is their capacity to form rouleau. Okay, so that's just a fancy term for make basically clusters of cells. Or aggregates. Now this is a reversible process, it's, it's unlike clotting. Basically, 
this is reflecting a balance of the pro and disaggregating properties of erythrocytes. And we'll talk about some of the disaggregating properties later. But what we're seeing here is because the, flow, uh, the fluid is not moving or it's under very low shear conditions, the cells have an opportunity to form clusters and therefore the effective particle size in the fluid is larger and therefore there's more internal resistance to flow. The great thing about flowing blood is that we start to see that the size of these rouleaux shrink. And so you can actually see now we've got smaller aggregates and therefore the particle size is reduced, the blood is becoming thinner. And then as we increase the shear rate, we can also see that once the cells have become completely disaggregated, we can see that the blood viscosity has dropped accordingly. Now, if you pay attention to the uh, late part of this curve, we can actually see that blood starts to thin or continues thinning well beyond the point at which aggregates are still present. And as a result, we know that there are other determinants of this shear thinning uh, profile. For the sake of time, I won't go into the plasma effects at this point. Some great work by um, Suksan Shin over in Korea has basically demonstrated that the rigidity of red cells also influences the viscosity of blood. So what we can see here, the green curve, is basically what normal healthy red cells do with respect to shear thinning. Now the reason that we see, well, the reason that we see this shear thinning occurring out here is basically red cells have an increased capacity to align with fluid flow, particularly at higher shear rates. And as a result, we see thinning of the fluid. It also assists with axial migration. So we basically get a lubricant effect of plasma at the vessel wall. And this does uh, influence the shear stress that's uh, being induced onto the vascular network. What we can see in the yellow curve in the middle is effectively red cells that have been exposed to free radicals. Now this is a hydrogen peroxide model, but we use many different models in our lab. We can either reduce nitric oxide and make the cells more rigid, or we can induce superoxide treatment, which basically leads to changes in the composition of the cell membrane. We basically see cross-linking of proteins and indeed uh, rigidification of the, of the erythrocyte. And as a result, we can see that there's an upward translation at any given shear rate of the blood viscosity. And so this is particularly important in different pathological conditions, okay? So we've already talked about the inflammatory and hematological disorders. Um, obviously, other things like sleep disorder breathing, we see this hyperviscosity occurring as well. What I'd like to point out here is physical activity. This is a good example of showing that the blood viscosity itself, and when it's hyperviscous, isn't always a detrimental um, attribute, okay? So when we go for a run or when people, elite athletes indeed, go do exercise, we actually see an acute hyperviscosity. But the difference is that this is actually a very important regulatory mechanism for autoregulation of flow. And the reason for this is that we've got a very normal reactive vasculature. Whereas we see in these other conditions, once we've got more rigid tubes, the hyperviscosity becomes a negative attribute. Increasingly important in our work, and particularly other groups around, are those where we see mechanical circulatory support. Okay, so rotary blood pumps used in ECMO or bypass, and indeed implantable FADs or total artificial hearts, we actually start to see that the micro uh, properties of erythrocytes, indeed the, the blood itself, is also representing some in, um, impacts on blood viscosity. We'll talk about that in some time. So I guess making the point for why we should study high shears, I mean, if you talk to people, uh, I guess, in isolation of mechanical support, people might say, why do you explore supraphysiological shear stress? It's not meaningful. Well, we know that increasingly, um, circulatory support is used to support uh, basically all sorts of cardiothoracic interventions. In fact, around about a million surgeries each year require these devices. Now, a lot of you people would know more than I, but these devices basically have uh, a blood pump as well as oxygenators, and these are very high shear regions, okay? We can actually see anywhere in the order of 150 to 250 pascal, okay, being induced on the fluid in these circulations. Now, put that in perspective with our in vivo uh, conditions, effectively our own blood is only ever exposed to about 10, maybe 15 pascal if you're lucky in vivo. So this is a really unusual and artificial environment. Now this is also important with respect to the increasing use of VADs and total artificial hearts. We know that previously these used to be used short term, basically as a bridge to transplant, okay? We basically would put these in, wait for a donor heart to become available. But of course, we know that probably nine out of 10 people waiting a donor heart will never receive one, thus these are actually becoming destination therapies in their own right. 
So the question is, how do these high shears influence blood health and therefore blood viscosity? Well, it's been known for a long time. In fact, looking at uh, mitral valves, prosthetics, effectively hemolysis had been observed back in the 60s. Okay? And you can actually see on this micrograph all sorts of unusual uh, responses with the blood cells. Fragmentation, echinocytes or crenation of the cell, in, in fact, uh, spherocytosis. So effectively, the blood itself is becoming quite damaged. And it was not known for a long time whether this was truly... I'm not quite sure what I'm doing there, but I... Is that the, uh, the way of saying get off the stage? <laughs> I'm not sure. Oh, here we are. Okay. Um, effectively, we... Um, <laughs> We weren't sure whether it was just mechanical uh, forces that were leading to this. Some great work done over in Aachen was actually one of the first systematic ways of demonstrating <coughs> that there was a hemolytic threshold for blood. And it was thought that around about 400 pascal for about a half second exposure would lead to true blood damage. Now this has been, I guess, um, updated more recently and we can actually see that even down at about 150 pascal or thereabouts, we can start to see quite substantial hemolysis and blood damage. And it's kind of conflicting because a lot of the blood pumps that have been designed were trying to avoid uh, basically 400 pascal, but now we're seeing that much lower shear stresses actually induce blood damage. And so the question might be, how well engineered are our blood pumps at the moment? Looking at what happens in vivo with implantables, you can actually see a variety of different blood pumps being used here. And uh, without needing to go into too much detail, you can actually see within the first three days of implant that both hematocrit and hemoglobin content of the blood substantially reduces, and that is true out to about 60 days, which was tracked in this data set. And the question might be, well, does this actually have any clinical in, uh, um, in, I guess, influence? And the, que the answer is yes, okay? I've picked on ECMO here because these are probably the most extreme um, you know, po population receiving mechanical support, but only about four in 10, depending on who you read, patients on prolonged ECMO actually survive to discharge. And if you look at more globally blood pump use, these are implantables, bypass, as well as ECMO, you actually see the freedom of adverse offense is about one in 10 patients within 12 months, okay? So we've got a long way to go with respect to blood pump uh, design and in fact use. Now the question might be, what's actually causing this problem? We're starting to think that hemolysis probably isn't the best endpoint. Now I think most people in this room would agree that if the cell's there or not, probably isn't the best index of what you could call blood health. We're starting to suggest that this thing called sublethal damage basically impacts on the uh, the mechanical properties of the cells are actually more important than just the cell being present or not. And so th the conspiring factors here are likely the high shear stresses and the oxidative stresses that basically lead to impacts on the biophysical properties of the blood. Without going into detail for time, ultimately the heightened blood viscosity leads to stagnation and slow flow across the microcirculation. We believe that this leads to an impairment of flux and therefore organ damage. And if you start looking at basically the primary outcomes from bypass, ECMO, etc., you, you start to see that these divergent or quite diverse um, outcomes, multi-organ failure for example, probably do have a common etiology. Okay? They seem like they're disrelated, but if the microcirculation is impacted, then it probably is showing that there is some common cause at some point. I better be careful explaining this. This one is uh, some local work from Professor Langer's group, and it's really nice data actually, demonstrating that um, the hematocrit, and for the sake of time, we'll just focus on the black and orange columns, the pre and post bypass. You can actually see that hematocrit in this data set on the far left was pretty much preserved, okay, post uh, bypass. But their data is actually quite nice in showing that hematocrit does not always equal blood viscosity. If you look at the middle column here, we can see the blood viscosity when measured at 225 inverse seconds, which is fairly typical of the shear rates in the arterial system, under low metabolic rates at least. We can actually see there's been a significant increase in blood viscosity within four hours of bypass. Indeed, this has been in some ways related to elevations in plasma viscosity, okay? So the inflammatory response subsequent to surgery may um, explain this heightened blood viscosity. Nevertheless, we can actually see that the, um, there is an extra um, effect over and above plasma viscosity that might lead to this heightened um, hyperviscosity of blood. And so what are the other properties that could be explaining this? Professor Kamenevas group in Pittsburgh have actually demonstrated that the implantation of a VAD 
in a bovine model leads to uh, quite substantial hyperaggregation of red cells. So if you have a look at the left micrograph here, basically you can see an even distribution of the erythrocyte. Now, comparative physiology, um, the bovine model is quite unusual because the cells don't aggregate. They're quite unlike yours and mine. However, once you can see the implantable was um, placed in, you can see that there's been an aggregation. You can see these windows of light now where the cells are basically clustering in 3D rulo. And as a result, one of our doctoral students explored this more quantitatively rather than just using photographs. And we can actually see that this index here on the bottom left uh, basically increases in this uh, variable in indicate an increased magnitude of aggregation. And within a single pass of a high shear region typical of blood pumps, we can see increases in red cell aggregation. <coughs> Panel B here is just the half time or the kinetic data looking at aggregates. And we can see that not only is the magnitude of red cell aggregation increased, but also the rate at which aggregates form is increased. And so we actually took this a step further. Instead of just saying, is aggregation increasing or not, we started to look at the surface chemistry of cells. I'll get you to focus on the top panel here. What we can see is the amount of sialic acid, an important glycoprotein on the cell membrane that basically gives the cell its negative charge. Now, typically, erythrocytes have a negative charge so they repel each other. They don't want to aggregate. What we can see is a single exposure to a high shear region essentially decreased the sialic acid on the cell membrane and this continued in a stepwise manner. Down the bottom, we can see the amount of free sialic acid. This is the unbound, basically, in the plasma, and we can see that, basically, if you cleave sialic acid from the cell membrane, it's now free. It kind of makes sense. And a functional measurement of this was looking at the negative charge of the erythrocyte, or the electrophoretic mobility. And what we can see is that a very quick, a single um, exposure to high shears made the cell less able to repel. It basically had a reduced negative charge. And so it does change its blood behavior. And it's likely that some of this surface chemistry and biophysical properties is explaining why blood is hyperaggregable and therefore hyperviscous in bypass. I'm going to try and skip here. We can see that the cell deformability is also very important for dictating high shear blood viscosity as well as its capacity to pass through the microcirculation. And in fact, looking back in 2004, it's well known that not all superphysiological shears are equal. If you just go slightly above the physiological range by about 50%, you can actually see that the amount of elongation of the erythrocytes under increasing shear was not affected. Whereas if we only go to 56 pascal, just keep in mind, remember, that bypass is operating at about 150 to 200 pascal, that there is basically a decrease in the amount that the cells can deform with a time-dependent manner here. So basically, within 30 seconds of exposure, there was a downward translation of the amount that the cells could deform. And in fact, by 60 minutes, there was actually quite a substantial decrease in cellular deformability. And so based on this, you can actually see there's probably some tipping point between what we'd say would be superphysiological and tolerable and superphysiological and intolerable cell deformation. And so myself and a, a true leader in the field, Professor Meisman in Southern California, started to explore what is the tipping point? What is the point where cells go from tolerable shears to intolerable? And we, we were able to find this 3D surface map, which basically predicted quite um, pr uh, reproducibly the amount of shear that cells could tolerate before they became basically more rigid. And without going into detail, we've been able to produce this 2D map that for any given shear stress, now we can figure out how long the cells can basically be exposed before they'll start to show irretrievable damage. Now, quite intriguingly, we're seeing that at 80 pascal, near instantaneous shear exposure limits their capacity to deform. And the asymptotic value is quite low when compared with um, circulatory support. And so does this model stack up? One of our doctoral students has just been exploring this, and you can see that we've basically got three different curves here. The black is basically that 2D curve I showed you on the previous. That is the subhemolytic threshold, so to speak. Then we basically expose blood cells to 10 pascal above. This pre uh, should predictably impair cellular deformability. And then we uh, expose the cells to 10 pascal below the subhemolytic threshold. Effectively, this shouldn't lead to damage. On the right-hand panel here, higher values reflect impairments in cellular deformability. And I guess without going into each data set, we can see there's a fair trend here, that green typically is the best response, red demonstrates impairments in cell deformability. <coughs> Again, for the sake of time, I won't go into too much detail.
Now, I'd like to make the point here that a lot of us still use plasma-free hemoglobin as an index of blood health or tolerance to high shears. I'd like to point out that basically this index of cell deformability is happening well before any changes in plasma-free hemoglobin, okay? So within 30 passes of an HVAD, we can actually detect impairments in maximal cell deformation, small albeit, but it is predictable. And this is actually happening well before we see any increases in plasma-free hemoglobin. So the cell biophysics are more important in our opinion than whether the cell itself is present. I guess the last conclusion, I'll just jump to the final point here, because I know we are short for time. Really the question might be, and this is what we're really trying to endeavour to answer, is how much of the health burden that's associated with mechanical support is due to altered blood rheology and cell biophysics? And um, it's an incredibly fruitful area of work, and I must thank uh, my team. We're Australian, so of course we have to have a picture of us in the bush. And um, of particular note, I'd like to thank Professor Jeff Tansley. He's an incredibly bright blood pump designer who co-leads the mechanical engineering department that we're working with, as well as some of the doctoral students and, um, and associated colleagues. Thank you for your time.